let's go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for joining another one of our webinar series. Uh, today we're going to focus on skill profiles and uh, scheduling techniques and really uh, scheduling techniques that comes into dealing with things like capacity versus demand, uh, plan versus actual stuff like that. So we're going to go over sort of what a skill profile is, um, some tips on what to consider for a skill, skill profile, and then how that actually folds in or factors into uh, demand versus capacity. So uh, let's talk about why why to use skill profiles. So if you didn't know, OpenAir does have a skill database. Uh, and it's basically a skill database that you set up the way that you need it to. So the resource database, the skill database, is something you define, and it and it there is very much supporting of something very similar to like if you did spreadsheets. So you say this person has this skill set, maybe there's a level involved with the skill set. So um, so it's it's a basic tracking mechanism, but uh, what you can track anything you want in that. It doesn't have to be a quote unquote skill. It can be things like a travel preference or you know, how do you take your coffee, which of course is silly, but, um, but you can make it be anything that makes sense for your organization to track, okay? Now, as we talk about skill profiles, um, what I typically see tracked are things like product experience, like what products, so, you know, if you're a services firm that does Oracle consulting? You know, what type of Oracle products can you support? Um, industries, very good for services to be able to, like I'm skilled in working with creative agencies and consulting firms and pro uh, software product companies um, and not too strong on people who uh, work for the Department of Energy, okay? So product experience and industry experience are very good. Um, and then what types of roles people have played on projects? Uh, I think that's a good one so that you can understand if somebody, you're short on project managers, can somebody lead the project um, that may have a little bit of project manager experience, okay? Um, other things I see people track are um, something like soft skills, you know, uh, what can you use Excel, can you do, uh, can you do presentations? Um, I think those types of skills are a little bit harder to be good at with a skill profile because many times they're very subjective. Um, they may not be accurate, and you may never actually use them in any kind of search. So, so I I like to look at like what makes sense to search on in a skill profile. Um, product experience may be too high level, uh, where you need to break it down into different categories, like what databases you support, what software that you know, what programming languages you know, things like that. Um, so there's there's good things to track and good levels of details, and then there's extra stuff that's just noise and it makes it more complicated than, than you really need, okay? So the pitfalls that I've seen customers um, fall into in setting up a skill database is trying to be overly compensating, um, trying to track all the detail of things. So I can, uh, I'm very good at open air UI1, UI2, and now UI4, UI3 and UI4. Um, but no one cares about uh, the level of detail uh, and, and the version numbers. They really just, do you know open air, okay? Um, so sometimes the version numbers that are tracked are, are noise that you don't really need. Uh, if there's a major change like, you know, Windows XP to, to Windows, you know, Windows 95, Windows XP, Windows 2010, those are all big shifts. Uh, so maybe those make sense to track by product version numbers, but not, not everyday, you know, tools that have multiple versions that come out along the way. Um, Keep your skill profile list very succinct, very um, uh, focused on what you need to use it for. Now that's a very general term I just said, what to use it for, but the typical use for what you use it for is, I need someone who knows this, okay? I need to staff a project that some, that, that, with somebody that knows this. So what do you need to look for in the organization that tends to drive the skill profile, okay? Things that everyone should do as part of their normal job, don't put that in a skill profile. Um, people need to be able to, you know, uh, you know, do presentations. Uh, you, some people are good at it, some people are not good at it, but you don't need to track that in a skill profile unless your company's focus is training people on how to be the best presenters possible, then of course that makes sense. Um, but for many services firms, that, that soft skill is something um, that you handle through professional development and not necessarily track it in the skill database of open air. 
Uh, what I find are good things to track are, of course, product and industry, because that tends to be driven um, by the need of your organization. As you sign new deals, as you get new professional services engagements, you need to find people that know certain products, know certain industries, like even in Top Step. Of course, everyone has to know Open Air, but you know, some people know Dell Boomi for as an integration tool. Others are experts on Integration Manager, yet others are uh, experts on Soligo. So those are different kind of products that we need to make sure that people have experience in, in to be able to support different types of uh, implementation. Uh, industries, languages. Languages are a good one, especially if you're a global company. Uh, you ha run into uh, organizations that need someone to you know, be able to speak and write and read in, in Japanese or in Spanish. Uh, so languages and knowing who's fluent on stuff is pretty good. Uh, location, I see people wanting to track location because when you're scheduling resources and trying to find the best fit, uh, location is one of those great things to say, okay, so if I have a choice between two people, which person is closer? that it'll be less expensive to send them from on a travel, so it's, it's less cost to the customer. Um, the only problem with location, um, there's a lot of locations in the, in the world, so it's pretty hard to get a comprehensive list that um, can get you all the detail you want. So the so location tends to be a little bit more higher level, uh, maybe what office you report to, or, or what part of, you know, are you on the East Coast or West Coast of the US, or you, in the country in Europe, uh, those that tends to be the lowest level that people drive down to in a skill profile. And then finally, uh, technology skills, things like uh, do you, if you write code, you know, do you know JavaScript? Because open air supports JavaScripting, you know, what databases you understand, what operating systems, uh, things like that. Those are all, these are all very technical, as you can tell. Uh, the languages is more of a, you know, um, business, Skill, and then location is you know something like a physical thing that you need to consider so I think this is a good list that a lot of customers will uh, you know, consider putting into their skill database and build it up that way so that these are all very useful uh, in the system okay uh, once you decide what you want to track then you have to decide is there a secondary category that goes with each of those um, things like level of expertise years of experience um, is your certification current or expired? Those are all things called attributes. And the attributes are defined at the level of the skill category that you set up. Um, and once you identify sort of the, the, the attribute that you want, you define the attribute and then you link the two together. You link the skill type and the attribute together to get your, your full profile, okay? Um, the, the thing about attributes I see when people are setting up their skill database is that um, it's, it's, it's hard to make an attribute objective. Currently, you know, something like an attribute for a skill category such as certification, whether it's current or expired, that's black and white. But if it's, hey, how well do you know open air? Okay, so there's, if you have things like, I'm a novice, I'm an expert, I'm, you know, average, you know, that's very subjective. People have to select things that um, make sense to them, but may be interpreted differently um, by someone else. Uh, I like to use more objective terms, like how many years of experience have you had in, in configuring open air? If I see somebody that has one year of experience, um, maybe they've dealt with one or two deployments, so they may not have a breadth of experience with the features. If I see someone with 10 years of experience, um, I would tend to, to lean toward, they probably know a lot of the features, uh, unless they've just de been deploying it the same way for, <laughs> for 10 years. So wherever possible, I like to try and set the attributes to something very objective. Um, versus subjective, because subjective is open for interpretation, um, which is a, the best way that I can, I can describe it for, for that. Um, if, you, if you haven't set up a profile before, let me sort of show you how these things connect together in the system. And let me get to my open air system. So if I go into administration uh, in the resource module, there's this thing called resource profiles, okay? When I open that up, that's sort of our basis of what is active. 
and you check the box next to the row that you want to be active. You can call stuff whatever you want. Um, but once you check a box that says active and give it a name, now that shows up as something underneath resource settings that you can give a list of things to. So if I go to technologies, this is the list of technologies that we have in our little database that we care about uh, for top step. Okay. So it doesn't have to be, you know, huge and comprehensive, but you have 42 of these categories to pick from. So ideally your database fits within uh, a list of 42 options. And each one of these options then has a list of values for it. So here are the technologies we support, the languages we support, the user space. Um, from here, you identify the attribute set. Now the attribute set has to be predefined because you have to select what attribute goes with this skill category. So if you look at the resource settings, there's a standard thing called attribute sets. And when I pick that, I have the ability to define what is an attribute set. So here's the expertise one with the subjective stuff that doesn't, you know, it's open for interpretation. But if I define that attribute set, now I can attach it to a skill profile category. Okay, and that's the basics for setting up the database. Right, you define the category with all the values, you set the attribute set, and you're done. Okay. Of course, the bigger thing are for people to actually put the data in the system for their profile. And an accurate, up-to-date profile is a useful profile in open air. But I gotta tell you, and all of you are on the phone here probably already realizing it, the minute somebody fills out their profile, it's out of date, almost. So keeping it up-to-date is really the hardest part of the profile use in open air. There's no automated re reminders that get sent out. Um, so the tips that I give people are, one, um, to, to set up a script that can send a reminder out based on a certain criteria per person. Um, that is, you know, but it's an email. Uh, but you can send a reminder to folks to say, hey, by the way, update your profiles. It's the end of Q2. Make sure you put new certifications or skills or update things uh, in the system, okay? Um, the last time you update uh, a, a profile can be recorded in the database. So there's an advanced report called resource profiles that gives you the last update date so that you have some kind of audit trail uh, to, to be able to use. However, there's a little trick I like to tell people um, that is not obvious. Um, there is a way to force OpenAir to send an email to everyone. Um, depending on a profile category. And that is a notification option that is built into the skill database. Um, there is a column in the configuration called notify users when, okay? Notify users when a new type is created. So what you can actually do is um, make sure people have, everyone's selected at least a single category that is, maybe it's the category that says, please update, you know, um, or one of the standard uh, skill categories that you have here. And all you have to do is simply create something that says trigger alert or reminder. Like you just have to create something, anything in the list here. So in user states, if I say, I'm just gonna create a new user state, update your profile and hit save. The user state is actually triggering a notification and that notification came to me because um, I know I've, I've got the email. It should become, I shut my email down so you guys wouldn't see it. But I had set it up so that when I add something into the system, it's gonna trigger an email now to everyone that has this in their, in their profile. And it will say there's been a new profile entry added and it'll put the name of my profile entry, which is please update your profile. <laughs> So there's little tricks like that that you could use to sort of force the notification to come out. It's not a scheduled one, but it is something that you can actually use in the system to force an email to go out to everyone uh, in the system. Okay. Now, uh, if you don't use that little reminder technique, of course, the best ways to get a profile updated would be on things like a quarterly performance review or an annual performance review have your manager rely on your skill database as part of that review. 
um, so that you have a way to um, understand when it's updated and when it's out of date. Okay. Um, or use tags like current and expired. Um, those are attribute sets that you would use for certain categories. All right. Now, once you have a profile, where can you use it? So the main areas that you can use a profile is for searching for somebody or for searching for somebody. <laughs> so it's really for searching for somebody. Um, and there's a lot of different functionalities in the system where you can basically use the search. Uh, as many of you know, there are three different types of searches in OpenAir in the resource module. There's a quick search, uh, which gives you the ability to look up something by the skill category. There's the custom search, which allows you to combine categories and availability and other factors. And then the newest one is the advanced resource search, which is similar to custom, but it has some more functionality on top of it and uses a different search algorithm to find the best match. And that's really the one that we tend to advertise most with customers as the advanced search because they keep enhancing that every, every release to be able to use that, um, that resource search and do compare views and all that kind of stuff in the system. So I have a slide for each of these. I'm watching the time, so I don't want to run out of time, but the quick search, if you're not familiar with these, with these uh, search options, they're in the resources module. And the quick search is simply that. What category am I looking for? And I'm looking for anyone who has open air experience. And that's it, just a quick look up. And you can even filter by attribute if you have the attribute column, but it's a quick look up doesn't give you much more information than that, so it's really just who has it. Versus the custom search, which has also been in open air for a number of years, where you can mix and match things together. Uh, and you can combine both uh, profile elements and entity tags, and that's a whole other uh, presentation, entity tags. Um, but you can combine features together and then also include availability so that you're finding a better match for people. There's more intelligence to this type of search and the results that come back from it. And the third type of search, the one that has been um, brought up in a number of the past few releases is the advanced resource search. And here you can certainly save a, a configured search, but you search for the kind of resource, is it regular or generic? Because a generic can have a skill profile and represent like a vendor, for example. Um, hourly cost was the latest update. Ron mentioned that in last month's webinar um, that you can search on people that fall into a certain cost category. Um, availability shows you, you know, who's a who's got a, yeah, availability for a certain time frame, percentage of time or um, hours, and then the entity tag filters. But then there's another tab that focuses on skills and experience. You can see here just by saying I'm looking on on the basics of a regular resource. It gives me a preview of there's 26 people that match this so far. I haven't hit the search button to get the results, but it's just letting me know there's 26 people. So if I go to the skills and experience, now I can start adding the skills that I want to, I care about. So from technology, I want anyone who has um, open air experience. And these are the you know the different levels that I'm going to support. Okay. So as I do this in the system, I'm still getting the 26 people. If I um, make this required, um, I don't have anyone that has eight to 10 in the system. So we, we have some old data in the system, of course, <laughs> as it comes here. Uh, and then as they do the search, it's gonna bring back people that match that criteria. So um, the advanced search, the adv advantage of this is not only do you get the preview and the criteria filtering here, when the results come back, you can use the compare view. It gives you a booked or assigned utilization chart. It shows you what matches. Um, right now, nobody's matching from a skill perspective. Everyone matches from a generic perspective. But here's the booked utilization for each of those individuals for the uh, defined time frame. So it gives you a lot more information when you're searching. And that's why the skill database really helps you take advantage, full advantage, of that advanced resource search, and more features are being added over and over and over again uh, to this advanced resource search. So that's one area where the data can be used for skill profile. The other area is actually part of your scheduling function. So as you think about your scheduling function in the system, 
um, the resource planner can actually display your skill database if you weren't aware of that. So one of the columns you can add is profile dash and then whatever the category is. And from there you can filter and you can look for people that have a skill and be able to understand how busy they are. So if I go back into our system, into the planner area, you can see here I've added technology as one of the items. And if I filter by the word open air, do contains open air. It's going to give me everyone that has open air in their skill database. And as I roll up availability, I can see, oh, it's these four people. And here they're very, very busy uh, the rest of June, but they're starting to become available in July. So you could actually do searches without using the search features. You can do searches inside your planning tools altogether if you want to. Okay. Uh, and then there is a reporting value, but the searching on the reporting is a little bit more limited. You can filter for just give me a list of people that have certain profiles. Um, but I, I like to use the planner as a way to filter stuff because when you run the resource profiles list, you get a row back for every single element that they have in their entire database. So you sort of get a little overwhelmed of, of information about their profile in the system. Now, how does this factor into capacity versus demand? And I realize we only have a couple of minutes left in the system, uh, in, the, in the webinar, but the three ways that I look at capacity versus demand is full-time headcount, the number of hours you need to deliver, or the amount of money that you are targeting to earn as, as a company. And each of those are made up of, you need people to deliver it, so what does it mean to look at the data in those ways? And how does the skill profile factor into that, that whole thing? So from a full-time equivalent, um, your skill database tends to drive more like the type of resource that you want. So that job role that you have in the database, you know, that's uh, doing full-time equivalent uh, standard reporting on job role or job code in the system, but then factoring in the skill profile into your planner for searching to try to find other resources that are available give you uh, what's currently in the system versus what's scheduled in the system. Uh, and so that job role component of the skill profile, I think is very useful to understand where they could fulfill uh, requests that are coming in. <clears throat> there is a job code detail report called quantity on staff, but this is literally a count. It's not the equivalent of the number of hours that people have available or the number of hours that people are scheduled. So be careful with using this one. It's a useful one. Um, but if people are sort of part-time, it's still going to count that person as a full head count. So you don't necessarily want to use that um, religiously on reports. The generics are going to represent the need for people. So I like to use generics on demand planning. When you get new projects in, you schedule the generics by like a job role, but you can also set up a whole resource profile for a generic so that you have an apples to apples view of hey, I scheduled a, this you know, DBA that knows Oracle, I'm, and I have a generic called an Oracle DBA generic, so I can actually use the search functions to find people based on skill profiles, and it'll bring back the generics and the regulars, so I can compare apples to apples on availability versus uh, um, uh, demand in the system. From an hours perspective, hours is what Open Air naturally wants to do. Of course, we schedule people by hours, we enter time by hours, everything's hours based. So from an availability perspective, your, um, your demand or your, avail your capacity is gonna be based on your work schedule hours, your calendars that you've set up in the system, but your demand is gonna be based on your scheduling, whether it's booked hours or assigned hours or booked with actuals, those give you the ability to see what kind of resource you need. And then you can compare the two together on the same report. How many hours do I have from work schedules versus how many hours do I have booked and who's gonna be available? And reports and the planner are both good ways to look at that information. And then finally, from a money perspective, um, all of those hours are, have a value, whether it's a revenue value, bill rate value, target bill rate value, um, all of those can be converted into money. So now you can look at money views and um, money, like you tend to, to look at money when you're looking at early planning of uh, maybe pipeline. Hey, we have to hit 800,000 this quarter. 
we're at 200,000, we need another 600,000, where's it gonna come from? Because from your budgeting, you know 800,000 will sustain the team, okay? So here you're basically combining the hours value, the capacity value, the demand of hours, with some type of bill rate expectation. So it's a target bill rate for capacity, it's an actual bill rate based on contracts or forecasting functions in the system. And that tends to drive things like using the cost levels in open air, repurposing them to be like a bill rate so that you can make uh, evaluate hours as um, a, some kind of money value. And then using charge projections to forecast the actual schedule or the demand so that you can get your projection information in the system. And those all come back into, into a single report. Can I do capacity versus demand from a revenue perspective? What's the money value of my staff that's on, you know, on staff right now, my headcount from a money perspective versus a demand of the projects that are coming in in my pipeline and backlog of what I need to deliver. Okay. And that all comes back to, okay, but then I can also use the skill database so I can see what, what kind of headcount and money can I earn based on the skills that I have on, on deck. And all of this last part of the webinar went through very quickly, but just know that the skill database, um, focusing it on just what you need in the organization is really gonna be key because you don't wanna put too much into it that you're not gonna use because then it becomes out of date very quickly and it just becomes noise. Focus on what you need and then leverage that in searches for people and in reporting so that you understand where, where you're coming from as far as who do you have on staff versus what you need from a demand perspective and set those dashboards and those reports up to be able to, to meet that. Um, and that's, that's the, the, the key on how the whole skill profile factors through uh, the whole activity at this point. Okay. So I went through that information very quickly. Um, so if you do want to know more, um, please, you know, send information over to us uh, through, uh, we have tweets, uh, Top Step tweets, uh, obviously our open air user group and uh, our info at topstepconsulting.com is a great way to send emails in um, to ask questions about this. So we want to thank you for your time now. Um, for those of you who have questions, uh, we're going to open up the line to, or the, I'll, I'll go to the Q&A session and see how much I can answer um, in that, in, in the questions that we have in the few minutes after we have this uh, the webinar.